So, screen capture works on the new OS. Any of you get uh, Sierra yet? Yeah. Yeah. I like the, the Siri. Yeah. What will the weather be like this afternoon? Checking out the weather in Mequon. Here's the forecast for this afternoon. Oh, I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. I just put it on last night. It's, a, it's about time. Yeah. I tried to scan this one. <laughs> And if you're wondering if he's going to get special treatment, I promise I'll fail him. So I'll redistribute his points to everybody else. Is that, that's fair? Yeah. All right. All right. Yes, yeah, so that's all I know how to do with Siri right now on the, <laughs> on the computer. I mean, I've been using Siri for years on the, the watch and stuff. But do I know how to close this? Yeah. Uh, the X didn't seem to be working. Um, all right. So homework assignment today was to do the second exercise from the uh, chapter five, right? Soccer team dealy flippy. How'd that go? Good. It was bad. So it was tough. All right. So you want to look at it? Can I go through it? All right. This all <laughs> presumes that I can solve it. <laughs> all right. What are we supposed to do? All right. Prompt the user to input five pairs of numbers. A uh, player's jersey number, 0 to 99, and a player's rating, 1 to 9. Okay, so this is their jersey number and kind of our, what, a presumed skill level of them, something like that. Uh, store the jersey number in one int array and the ratings in another int array. All right, so right off the bat, we're looking at this. We're going to need a couple of integer arrays to store two different sets of values, right? So we're going to have one integer array for storing a bunch of jersey numbers and another integer array to store a bunch of ratings. Uh, how many elements need to be in each of these integer arrays? Five, because we have they, they say we're going to read in information for five players, right? Now, these two integer arrays both have five, and bucket zero of, of the first one is the jersey number of the guy with the same rating in bucket one of the other one. Does that make sense? So these two arrays have something in common. Even though Java hasn't decided that they have anything in common, they're just two separate variables, we have decided from a problem-solving approach that bucket zero of this array is related to bucket zero of this array. Bucket one of this array is related to bucket one of this array. Okay? I'm not sure what your book calls this, but I refer to this model as parallel arrays, All right, where you have two arrays with the same number of elements in it where we store multiple aspects of something inside these buckets of the arrays. So this is kind of the precursor to objects, which we're going to be getting into shortly. Okay, um, so just, well, let's, just, let's just start with just that part. Let's just read stuff into the arrays before you even scroll down. All right, so we'll just do one thing at a time. All right. Well, oh, I don't have Eclipse open. Let's see if Eclipse works in the new OS. All right. So we need two integer arrays capable of holding five buckets each. How do I build an integer array? Well, the generic syntax for a variable is type name equals value, semicolon. So one integer array, let's call this guy, uh, what, jersey numbers? Can I spell that? Yeah, I can probably spell that. So we'll say that its type is an integer array. We'll call this guy jersey numbers, like that. We'll set that equal to a new integer array of size 5. Remind me, what does the new keyword do here? Go ahead. Okay, so this is kind of like our real estate agent. It goes out and finds us enough land. How much land do we need for this guy? How much memory do we need for this particular array? Okay. Not five bytes. Five something. What am I holding? I'm holding five of what? 
Five ints, okay, and how big is an int? 32 bits or four bytes, okay? So I need a total of 20 bytes of memory, correct? Okay, and that memory has to be contiguous. What does that mean? Next to each other, okay? And why do I need contiguous memory? Okay, so I need contiguous memory because it's an array? I, mean, I, I guess that's true. It's kind of a circular, <laughs> becomes a circular <laughs> argument. <laughs> Arrays have contiguous memory. Well, why do you need contiguous memory? Well, because it's an array. <laughs> All right, so why do, how do, how do arrays benefit from uh, requiring contiguous memory? Last class near the end, we talked about uh, uh, kind of a foreshadow of where we're going near the end of the semester and most of next semester with these linked data structures. And I mentioned that the, uh, um, I mentioned that arrays are two things. They have a pro and a con, and that linked, a uh, linked list is the same two things, but pros and the cons are flipped. So what's the pro and a con of an array? And I think he mentioned last class that one, one con, this isn't the one I'm thinking of, uh, about arrays is that we, uh, if you want to change the size of them, it's inconvenient, right? You got to build a new one. All right, so we'll take that off the table as a, as a possible answer. So what's good about arrays that is directly related to them being implemented using contiguous memory? Go ahead. They're fast because you can always populate the memory address in any bucket that you want. Yeah, they're fast. We can get the bucket whatever of an array using math. We go to the base address of the array and then offset from that, and that takes us right to an address. Okay? That's why it's required to be contiguous. If the array was stored all over memory, we wouldn't be able to say, oh, I need to go to offset three times size of int off this base address. I wouldn't be able to get there mathematically. I would have to go hunting <laughs> for, for, that, for that bucket, right? Now, that's the way linked lists work. Linked lists have to store some extra information for us to go and find that next place in memory. Okay, so a, a pro about arrays is they're fast. What's a con about arrays? What's the trade-off? So for that speed, we're trading off memory efficiency. We need a big enough plot of land right next to each other to build that array. We can't build a little bit of it here and a little bit of it here and a little bit of it here. All right. Now, for the most part, for today's programmer, we don't really view that as a major con because we have a lot of memory. Okay, uh, but previously we had the discussion about the Y2K thing. Memory used to be a very, very different story for us. So in the early days of programming, let's say the late 60s, well, certain, certain in the late 60s and uh, early 70s, um, you had to be constantly aware of your memory footprint for your program. Where today we just don't care, right? I mean, it's, you know, our program is this big and we're throwing it into an Olympic-sized swimming pool times 20. <laughs> we got plenty of room for, uh, for, for, uh, for our stuff. All right. Now, that isn't to say we can't run out of memory, but if you run out of memory in your computer, you've either A, introduced an infinite loop that's just eating memory, or B, you know what you're doing. And you <coughs> then would know how to add more memory. You know, you, we talked a little bit last time, the virtual, Java virtual machine kind of creates a level of fake memory because it's a program that runs, in this case, on the Mac OS. For some of you, it's running on Windows, uh, Windows 10, Windows 8, whatever, Windows 7, uh, whatever you're running. So it's running on top of that operating system. So the operating system manages the pool of memory. And then on top of that, you have the Java virtual machine, which manages its own fake pool of memory, which directly relates to real memory. All right? So it has to grab that chunk of memory. So if you want to... Uh, uh, Make a comparison there. The Java virtual machine is kind of like an array from a memory inefficiency perspective. Because when you launch the Java virtual machine, it immediately grabs a big chunk of memory from your real memory. And would you probably assume that uh, most Java programs, uh, well, the, the default value for the Java virtual machine, however much RAM it gives you, is probably far more than you need 99% of the time. So you're using this much memory and it's actually reserved this much. 
which means that in terms of your actual system memory, this much memory is being used. That makes sense? So we would call that inefficient uh, in terms of, you know, being a good steward of our resources, right? But the reality is, is we don't care because we have 8 or 16 gigs of RAM. Life's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Even if, with your, if you go with a budget pleaser computer today uh, and it has 4 gigs of RAM. It's a lot of ints. <laughs> you can store a lot of ints in 4 gigabytes of RAM. All right, so not really a problem. So the size of an integer is 4 bytes, 32 bits. We need 5 of those. So that means we need 20 bytes of contiguous memory. That's what this real estate agent goes and gets for us. All right. And it returns the memory address into this guy. And that memory address is the base address of the array. What do I mean by base address? We've kind of already explained it in the last couple of minutes, but let's, let's give a meaning to that word just to kind of put a bow on this review. What do I mean by the base address? Is this a 10 a.m. thing or a quiet group thing? Go ahead. Okay. It would be the first address. So I use the example of 100. Yep. So, okay. So why would we call it the base address? I mean, you're right. It, it happens to coincide with the first element of the array. But why specifically do I call it the base address? Huh? Okay, so it's primarily where the array starts, all right? But I'm still calling it the base address. So when I need to get to bucket five of an array, I start with the base address, and then I offset from that base address to the actual place. So the base address, or our starting address, I guess would maybe be a, a is that a clear name? It's not, the, it's not the historically correct name for computer science, whatever, but, you know, the base address of something is your starting point, and then we offset from that. And usually think, well, I say usually. I can't think of an example when this isn't true, so let's just say always. Um, something that has a base address would rely on contiguous memory. Actually, I already have an example, linked list. Linked list would have a base address, I guess, technically, which would be the very first element in the list. And they're going to point to another place in memory that it doesn't have to be right next to it. So, but I, I don't know, I don't know if they call those base addresses or not. Okay, so we have our first array here. Then we're gonna have a second array. So int array, and what was this guy for? Player rating. Player rating. And this guy's gonna be a new int array also of size five. Okay, and um, now we need to read some crap in from our user, right? So we're going to need our tool for inputting stuff from the user. What do we use to input stuff from the user? Scanner. Scanner is our tool from Home Depot that lets us read stuff in from the user. So we'll say scanner input. You can name it whatever you want is equal to a new scanner. And this guy requires the input stream that we want to read in from. So for us, the only one we know about is system.in. That's the keyboard. Okay. So there's our scanner. Uh, then we want to ask the question, well, we want to read in stuff five times, right? So when I want to repeat something multiple times, what do I do? I need a loop, okay? And you said a for loop specifically. Why a for loop? What kind of problem does a for loop lend itself to? Counting. Counting type problems. Problems where we know how many times we want to loop through. In this case, we know we want to do something five times. So we're going to use a for loop to go through five times. Make sense? What kind of problem does a while loop lend itself to? Yeah, where we don't know how many times we have to spin through. So like press any key to continue. <laughs> how long will it be till we press the, well, what's the old joke? Press the any key. Well, where's the any key? You know, might be a second, might be 10 minutes, might be never, right? Like in my office right now, I'm upgrading to Sierra. It's probably already waiting for me to hit that next button. <laughs> who knows when I'm going to get back there to hit that button all right so we're going to go ahead and write our loop so we're going to just create our kind of our stock loop to do something five times so for it i is equal to zero i is less than five 
I++. All right, so that's our go-to loop for doing something five times. Okay, and we traditionally use I as our counter, but you can use elephant there if you want. It doesn't have to be a short variable like this, but usually we would refer to this as a throwaway type index variable. Kind of make it short and sweet so it's easy to type when you need it and forget about it in a few minutes. Okay, usually though we want to have our variable names have meaning so we can remember that this guy holds our jersey numbers. This guy holds our player ratings. Okay, now each time through this loop, we want to ask a question. So what are we asking? We're asking, uh, what's the jersey number, something like that. Enter player whatever's jersey number. Let's steal that line here. So to print something to the screen, we use our system.out.println tool. So if we're going to do the print tool, that way it doesn't kick it down a line. All right, and what are we going to print? We're going to print... this guy, except player one, you know, we wanted to say player one, then player two, then player three, then player four, then player five. So this value right here, this value of one, this relates to our current counter i, correct? So it's actually i plus one, right? So the first time through the loop when i is zero, this is going to be i plus one's jersey number. Okay, so we're going to use string concatenation to build that guy in. And in here we're going to say i plus 1. So enter player, I'll probably put a little space here. And this will resolve to whatever the value of the current value of i is plus 1. So if i is 0, this will boil down to 1. If i is 1, it will boil down to 2, so on and so forth. And then we've artificially, as we glue, concatenate the, net, the rest of the string on there, we have our little, you know, single quote s for 1s, 2s, 3s place. All right, so we're just gluing together strings, uh, strings here. Jersey number. All right, then we need to read that jersey number in. So we're going to read in a value, an integer, and then we need to store it somewhere. Where do I store the very first jersey number? So I've gone to Target and I've bought two little organizers here, right? Shoe bench, desk organizer, I think what we were using last class, right? So I bought two five-bucket organizers, and I'm grabbing the very first jersey number. Where do I put it? Jersey, bug, jersey number bucket I, or the very first one would go bucket zero, right? Yep, but you're right. It's going to be I. So I'm going to take that jersey number that I read in. I'm going to go to my organizer. I'm going to stick that value in the very first container. Make sense? In the very first container, we index as bucket zero. So a five-bucket container has bucket zero through bucket four. So we're going to say jersey numbers at bucket i, because i will be 0 the first time, then 1 the second time, then 2 the third time, so on and so forth. So jersey numbers at bucket i is going to equal input dot next int. So that will read in an integer. So this guy reads an integer in, and ultimately this will resolve to the value it read in from the user. <coughs> All right. And similarly, this guy right here does what's called blocks. It's a blocking call. Uh, just give them an answer to that real quick. This prevents the program from continuing until some I.O. event <laughs> finishes. I.O. is input-output. So in this case, we've asked the user for some input, and now we're going to sit there and wait. We're blocking the programming, the program from continuing while we wait for the user to finally type something in and press enter. That could be a second, that could be five minutes, that could be who knows. They might just walk away and it's lunchtime. Okay? So that's what a blocking call is. Uh, if we wanted to put a uh, synonym 
for blocking call. I'm going to say it's a synchronous call. That's not going to be all that meaningful to us right now, and it actually might not be that meaningful to us in this course. But um, throughout your computer science career, we, as we start writing more complex things, we're going to start thinking about doing some things asynchronously, the, the, the opposite side of this, which means we have more than one thing happening at once. Okay, so asynchronous call would be a non-blocking call. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to get some stuff from you, but while I'm waiting on this, we're doing some other stuff over here. And for that, we use multi-threading and uh, other things. So not really um, applicable to us right now, just maybe in your, your trivia brain, connect these two words to each other because they're related. Okay? Um, so having said that, um, well, I don't know. What I want to say is I'll never quiz you on the word synchronous, but then you might not connect the two words. Um, I very likely won't ask you for the word synchronous. Okay? I'm much more interested in you understanding the concept of a, a call that blocks. Okay, But do relate these two somewhere in your mind. Okay. Any questions on blocking and synchronous? Kind of get what that means? Or... Okay, yep. All right, so we'll store in bucket I of jersey numbers the next value. Then we're going to go ahead and prompt them. It's probably a pretty similar prompt, right? Enter player one's rating. So here, it'll be easier for me to steal this line. And remember, I've encouraged you to not cut and paste very often. Type as much stuff as you possibly can so you can make your mistakes and then fix them and get used to that. Um, I'm already a lost cause, so it's a enter player eyes rating. All right, so I'm going to prompt them for the rating. So let's just print something to the screen. Then I'm going to read the rating in. So the rating is going to be in player ratings at bucket eye is going to equal input dot next int like that. All right, so we're going to read in five values. Make sense? Now, something I might do as a test case here, so if we're kind of approaching this the way I would approach this homework assignment, just to make sure everything's working okay up to this point, I might want to prove to myself that I accurately got those values read in. So that way I have the confidence that my two arrays hold the values in the right places and that kind of stuff before I start doing any other crap. All right. So we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to write a quick little loop. And we'll do this on jersey numbers.length i plus plus. And I'm going to just print out. Um, the value in jersey numbers and player ratings for e each element. So I'll do a system.out.println jersey numbers at bucket i system.out.println player ratings at bucket i okay so after I've read everything in, I'm just going to spin through again and uh, print everything out, proving I read it in. Now, why am I allowed to use I again when I used it up here? Didn't I already use a variable name I? Good. Okay. Okay, so this I, the one that I defined up here, it kind of lives and dies with this for loop. Yeah. And as soon as that loop ends, it's I'm free and clear to use I again, right? Okay, and we refer, do you remember the word we referred to this as? This is variable what? Where we have access to a variable is called variable scope, right? Variable scope. Okay, so the scope of I here, and, you know, 
for the record, it's way more important that you understand what it means than you remember the, the stupid name for it, right? <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, the scope of I is local to this block right here. And once that block ends, I dies because we specifically defined I inside of that scope. As opposed to this, if I had said int I like this, and then said I equals zero like that, now I scope is beyond this for loop. Notice it's screaming down here now that I already had a variable named I. Okay, because now I scope is from this point on within that scope. So now it governs both of those for loops. And like we've mentioned a few minutes ago, usually that counting variable for a for loop, we kind of think of it as, as a throwaway variable, right? It's, you know, it's extremely useful for a moment, <laughs> but we don't really need I 20 lines later. It's not a useful value to us. All right, so we would usually define it in here, and that allows us to forget about the existence of I when this for loop's done, and then we can just go ahead and use a that same counter again later on without worry because they're not going to conflict with each other. Uh, we might call that a feature of a for loop. It allows us to, to, to it, it comes with its own scope where the other loops do not. Okay, so we'll read in the stuff and then I'm just going to spin through and prove that we read it in there and all that crap. All right, so I'll hit play and I'm just going to do one through five for the jersey numbers, and then maybe five through one for the <laughs> for the other ones or something like that. No, I'll just keep counting. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, well, whatever, ten. All right, so there's all my stuff. Seems to have read in, right? And we can probably trust that it. this is jersey number rating, jersey number rating, five times. So we can feel confident that we read the stuff into the right place. We could have done a little print statement to label them or something if we wanted to, but we can say everything worked out okay here. All right, so let's go look back and see what we're supposed to do next. All right, so that was the part one of it. Part two, implement a menu of options for a user to modify the roster. Each option is represented by a single character. The program initially outputs the menu and outputs the menu after a user chooses an option. Um, the program ends when the user chooses the option to quit. All right, so we have this, uh, uh, this guy down here. We have a menu, and uh, we have what, five different options. We can update a player's rating. We can output a player's rating. We can replace a player. So replacing a player is going to replace that bucket in both of those guys with a new jersey number and a new rating. So it's like a brand new player. Okay, and we can output the entire roster, which is pretty similar to what we just did, right? Except we probably are going to add some labels and stuff so it looks pretty. All right, otherwise we can quit. All right, so right off the bat, after I've read everything in, we want to go ahead and show this menu. How many times am I going to show this menu? Huh? Just one time ever? I mean, I... I might I want to update a player's rating and then also replace another player? And then I might want to look at the current roster to see it. I mean, this is a menu that I want to have keep coming up over and over again until I'm done, <coughs> until I've quit, right? How long will it be till I quit? Who knows? Okay, so I want to show a menu on the screen multiple times. What do I use for repeating stuff? I use loops, loops to repeat stuff. Specifically... As most of you pointed out, I might want to use a while loop here. Why? While loops lend themselves to problems where we don't know how many times we're going to have to show this menu. I might show this menu one time, and the person might hit quit right off the bat. I might show this menu 4,000 times. Okay? The person may walk away and never actually hit quit <laughs> and just leave it running. Okay? And the while loop's going to be sitting there waiting for your next uh, input because that request for input blocks that we talked about, right? All right, so let's go ahead and build this menu. And it'd be really nice if we had already covered the next uh, section of user-defined methods here, but uh, that's, that's probably why they have this first. All right, so just for speed here, I'm going to steal that. Dump 
this guy here. So we're going to say um, before I wrap this in a while loop. Well, let's. We're going to need a Boolean expression. And this Boolean expression is going to allow us to do something multiple times until something occurs. Okay? Now, in our case, we want to keep showing this uh, menu until what happens? Until the user selects Q. So we're going to keep showing them the menu over and over and over again, asking them for which option they want until they finally choose the option Q. Make sense? Okay. Now, what's the minimum number of times we're going to show this menu? Go ahead. Once. Now, you've mentioned that we should use a while loop. We have a third kind of loop. What's the third kind of loop? Do while loop. What kind of problems do do while loops lend themselves to? When something has to happen at least one time. How many times does this guy have to happen? At least one time. So a do while loop is actually probably the better choice for this, isn't it? All right, so we're going to say do something okay, while something else is true. But that something is going to happen at least one time. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and throw our menu options in here. And I'll show you a little trick for fixing uh, indenting. As you see, it's uh, doing a very poor job of indenting here because I'm not closing my uh, So I'm going to go ahead and highlight all this. So now I've properly formatted it, right? I'm going to right click. I'm going to go to source. I'm going to do correct indentation. You can also do on a Mac, you can do command I. I'm pretty sure it's control I on a PC. And that'll clean it up for you. Make sense? Again, one of the features of why we use something like Eclipse rather than like Notepad. Little things like that. It's a text editor on steroids for programming stuff. All right. So this is going to show our menu on the screen, but we actually need to read in our answer, right? So after we show a menu, we need to say, okay, well, what do you want? <laughs> What's your choice? Do they tell us what the prompt should look like in here? Ah, choose an option. This guy right here. And that should probably be on a print line, right? Not, a, not an LN, just print to keep it all on the same line. Don't ha you don't have to do that, but it probably makes some sense. System.out.print. So we'll have choose your option. A little space after that guy. Then we need to actually read in the option. What tool do we use to read stuff in? What tool do we use to read crap in from the user? We use scanner. We, do we already have a scanner? Yeah, we don't have to go back to Home Depot and buy a new one. We have a scanner currently available to us in the current scope, right? All right, so I can just use this scanner again, except this time I'm not reading in an int. This time I'm reading in a character. All right, so using the books approach from before where they just say, give me char at of the, the value we read in. Now I need a place to store this character. So let's start off with trying to read it in. So we're going to say, input, which is the name of our scanner, dot next line dot char at zero. That'll give me a character, right? Okay, so, so if I type in U followed by just pounding on the keyboard, this will give me just the U <laughs> of that. All right, so this will get, this will ultimately boil down to a single char. But now I need to put that single char someplace. So I need a variable for remembering the last user's option. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and define a variable here. So we're going to say char, let's just call it option, 
and we need, we can initialize this. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start it off as like the question mark? Okay. No options have been put in yet. Doesn't actually, um, you know, actually we we don't actually need to give it a, a default value in this case. We'll just say char option like that. This would be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say option is equal to that. Okay. So I've given myself a place in memory to remember the option that was entered. I'm going to go ahead and set option to the current option. And then I want to repeat this menu as long as what happens. I'm going to have to do some other stuff in here. So I'm going to, you know, we're going to have to respond to the option here. So depending on which option they type in, I need to respond to it. But then I'm going to potentially show the menu again. And I want to keep showing the menu over and over again until they finally type in Q for the option. So I want to keep repeating this loop while what is not true. What's my Boolean expression here? Because this Boolean expression, as long as this Boolean expression boils down to true, we're going to spin back up and repeat the body of this loop. Okay? So what question? I'm going to say show the menu again as long as the user did not enter Q. So now we need to, how do we convert that sentence into a Boolean expression? Well, we know that what the user entered is stored inside the variable option, right? So there's option. And as long as that is not equal to the chart Q. So as long as they did not type in a Q, we're going to spin back up and do it again. And then I assume they probably want you to say goodbye or something afterwards when they finally quit. Well, it doesn't look like it. It's fine. Okay. So this will show our loop multiple times. So let's go ahead and test that. None of our options are going to do anything except Q. In fact, just for our own sanity, let's just do a system.out.println get lost. It'll be our, our going away present for them. Okay, and I'll post this up on Slack when we're when we're done, so you have the, the code. So enter player one's jersey number. Uh, we'll just do our one two three. String index out of bounds exception. Oh, I must have pressed enter an extra time because that thing blocks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, this guy should block, shouldn't it? Oh, it's reading in the, uh, interesting, okay. Let me just test this real quick and then I'll tell you how this works. Okay, yeah, the next line function, uh, it, blocks, so to speak, but it doesn't officially block. It starts reading from the buffer uh, whatever it can find, and it's looking for a enter key, a carriage return, and it's going to find one, the very last one we typed in. When we use next, this guy specifically blocks waiting for a full string from us. All right, so uh, did the book have you use next or next line? 
I used to work, so I work in the country. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's possible you wouldn't have bumped into that. But in any case, next specifically reads a string in, and it specifically blocks. Okay? And then we're going to grab char zero from that. Let's go back to our running program here. All right. So if I type in anything other than Q, so there's U, it's going to show it again. There's A, it's going to show it again. There's R, it's going to show it again. O, it's going to show it again. Now I type in Q, it says get lost. That's when I broke out of that loop. That makes sense? All right. So now we have our menu structure kind of doing what it's supposed to do. So now we actually need to write our logic. We have, we've already handled the, the quit case, right? So now we need to handle what happens when we update a player's rating. What happens when we output a player above a rating? So blah, blah, blah. So let's just deal with the U first. We're going to write one function at a time. So after we've read something in, right here, option will hold the value that the user entered. We have a series of things that we can do in response to what they entered in. So how do I respond to things? How do I say, what, did you, what would you like me to do? What kind of uh, structure do we use in programming to ask a question and respond accordingly? If statements, conditionals. Okay, so we're going to ask a question. So we're going to go ahead and throw a question in here. So we're going to say, if the user entered in a U, that is if option, this guy, which is a char, so if option, is equivalent to, double equal sign, no spaces, to a U, we're going to do that stuff. Okay? And what does update player rating, what, what should it ask for? Do they tell us the uh, what the thing should look, look like, or do they just make us use the logic? Hopefully they make us use the logic. Yeah, good enough. All right, so if we update a player's rating, that means we are changing the rater, rating for a specific player. Um, how do we uniquely identify one of our players in our uh, roster? Go ahead. By their jersey number. Okay. Um, I mean, we certainly could have taken a little shortcut here and said, well, let's update whatever player in our roster is at bucket two or something like that. But really what we should say is, hey, I want to I wanna update player uh, jersey number 74 with this new rating. That makes sense? So that means I need to be able to, first I need to read in the jersey number I'm interested in, right? Then I need to search through my roster to find the position in our roster of that jersey number. Then I need to read in the new value. Make sense? All right. So let's start off by um, reading in a jersey number and then searching for that jersey number. Little baby steps. All right. So we're going to use our scanner to input stuff, and we're going to read in a jersey number. We'll say jersey number, no S. We're going to say this guy, well, actually, let's prompt first. Put that next to int. That's what's going to go in there. Dot print. What player would you like to update? We're expecting them to enter a jersey number. They enter in a jersey number. So now I need to go and find the position of that jersey number in my jersey numbers array. Now, once I have the position, that then tells me that that same position in our player ratings array needs to be updated, right? Because I, I found the, the guy I want to I update. All right, so now... How do I search through jersey numbers for the jersey number they just entered in? Uh, 
I've put the five bucket organizer in front of you. How are you going to look through this organizer, checking each place for the jersey number? A loop. Okay, we know we need to go through a maximum of five times, right? A maximum of five times because we might find it early, right? So I'm going to check the first little cubby. Is, is this the jersey number I'm looking for? And next one, is this the jersey number? So on and so forth. All right, so I, I, I'm, I'm, the approach I'm taking here, and hopefully you're, you're, you're sensing this, I'm really trying to go very slow in the little tiny problems I'm solving. I'm trying to relate it back to what you would do in real life. Okay. You will not become a good programmer unless you get good at that skill. Okay. Not being intimidated that you're writing software, but instead we're solving problems like we do every day. Okay, Because we're all really good at solving problems. If I put a little uh, uh, five, five uh, element uh, organizer in front of you and say, you know, find the pair of scissors, you would laugh at me like it's something stupid, right? Well, here. <laughs> and then you throw them at me because I'm wasting your time, okay? Those are such trivial problems for human beings to solve. But now to break it down, because we don't even think about it. If I tell you to find the pair of scissors, you're going to glance at that thing in a, in a heartbeat and you're going to, well, there's the scissors, right? <laughs> there's bucket three, here. There's the scissors. I want us to slow down and actually think about what process did we actually go through to find those scissors? Did we glance at each of those individual buckets? You know, as short as that glance might have been, we kind of swept across it and found the thing we were looking for. But that's such a waste of our time, waste of our mental energy. Now, we're not, we're not even aware we're doing it. Does that make sense? That's the skill we're trying to recapture, is what do we actually do when we solve problems? Okay, so I'm going to have to loop through all of my jersey numbers looking for the jersey number that matches this value right here that I read in called jersey number. Now, don't confuse this variable jersey number with this variable jersey numbers. Different names. Okay, jersey numbers is an integer array. Jersey number is a single integer. Okay, because I defined it as a single integer right there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, create my loop that's going to go through every element in my array. So int i is equal to 0. i is less than jersey numbers dot length i plus plus. Um, now, why should we use jersey numbers dot length here instead of 5? What's the advantage of using jersey numbers that length here instead of five? Even though we know that jersey numbers that length will resolve to five because that's what we <coughs> set it as right here. And similarly, I'm going to steal this right here. And we're going to replace our hard-coded 5 up here with that. How many times are we going to read stuff in here? We're going to read stuff in here, jersey numbers dot length number of times, which happens to be 5 right now. Now it's 50. So I can change the size of my array, and because my logic is based on whatever the current size of the array is, it'll still work. Now it'll ask us 50 times. But after the fifth time, it's going to die. It's going to croak. It's going to scream at us. Why? Why is this code right here currently going to give us a problem after our fifth entry? See if somebody else gets it. It is okay sometimes to get wrong answers. You will uh, improve better if you 
engage. I know some people are just naturally quiet. As long as you're engaged, that's fine. So you don't have to answer. That's why I don't call on people specifically as I know that you're an outgoing person. But it would be in your best interest if you are an outgoing person to ah, throw an answer out there. If you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> I assume everything you say is wrong to begin with. You want to give a shot at this one? Yeah, so we're going to get that array index out of bounds exception, right? Uh, so I've broken my little, my scheme of saying these guys are parallel arrays. I have all my jersey numbers here, I have all of my uh, player ratings here, and I have the same number of both of those. Except I don't. <laughs> I have enough room for 50 jersey numbers, and I have enough room for 5 player ratings. Everything's... Uh, Fine, until we get to player rating number six, and <laughs> we try to put that value in there, and it screams at us. Now, I could, here's, I'm just going to show you a couple of possible errors you might run into. If you decide to go through your loop on player ratings instead of jersey numbers, which our logic says those should be equivalent values, right? If we're doing parallel arrays, those guys should be the same length, all right? So we can use those two values uh interchangeably, even though we've made a mistake up here by not making them the same length. Now we won't have an error because we only go through five times. We've wasted 45 buckets of jersey numbers, right? But we uh, won't have our error here. We'll instead have our error down here, <laughs> down here since we're still looping on, um, where are we at here? Since we're still looping on jersey numbers here, okay? So some things to be careful of. So we'll switch this guy back to five. Um, we can leave this as player ratings if we want, but if we want to just want to be consistent and always just go off of jersey numbers, we can. But we're fine as long as we make sure these guys match, and that's kind of our starting prerequisite for parallel arrays. Now understand that parallel arrays are a problem-solving approach by humans. Java doesn't know that these guys have anything to do with each other. We're making that connection, right? We went to Target, we bought two different organizers, and we're going to, the way we're going to use those organizers happens to be related to each other, okay? So I'm going to potentially search through all of my jersey numbers. Each time through, I want to ask the question, is the jersey number I'm currently looking at equal to the jersey number I want? Okay? So... The jersey number I want is called jersey number. So I'm going to ask the question, if jersey number is equivalent to the current jersey number I'm looking at. What's the current jersey number I'm looking at while I'm in this loop? This loop's going to look at I is 0, I is 1, I is 2, I is 3. So I'm going to be looking at jersey numbers at bucket I. Make sense? So is jersey number equal to jersey numbers at bucket I? If that's a true statement, that means I found the player they want to update. Make sense? So, if I found the player that they want to update, what do I need to ask them next? What's the new rating? Okay. So, hey, you want to update a rating? Fine. I found the player you asked me for. What's the new rating? So, system.out.print. What is the new rating? Okay, we'll say new Rating is equal to input dot next int. So that'll read in our next rating. All right, so now I have the rating, and where do I where am I going to put that rating? I found the jersey number at bucket four, let's say. I read in the new rating. Where do I put that new rating? Bucket four of the other array, right? Our player ratings array. 
So did I even need this variable here? Or do I already have a nice little bucket I can read it right into? So this is player ratings at bucket I. I found the jersey number at position I in my jersey numbers array. Therefore, I'll read in the new rating and store it inside of player ratings at bucket I. Player ratings at the same position. Does that make sense? Now, once I've done this, I know, well, I guess I don't officially know, but I should know that uh, most sports teams, they don't have duplicate jersey numbers, right? That would be a little... Like, while you're on the field, you might have the same guy with the same number? No, mostly, like, offense and defense. Okay. I got you. Okay, but we want to do add, add a little error checking in here. So, uh, for us, we're going to assume that uh, uh, we're, we, we've accomplished our task, right? Okay, so we have found the, the, the player. We've updated their rating. Now we're done. Do I, I don't need to search for any more players, right? Okay, but let's assume that this was my second time through this loop out of five. And at bucket uh, one in the loop, I happened to find the player. So I went ahead and I updated the player's rating. But now I don't want to loop back through and do this again. How do I get out of this loop? I'm done with the loop, right? I potentially needed to go through five times. In fact, we can even take it a f step further with error checking and say, you know, I potentially needed to look everywhere and then found that the person asked me to update somebody that didn't exist. But we'll try to limit our error checking for right now just so we can keep this shorter. But I found the player. I updated the player. I don't need to check bucket two or three or four. I'm done. How do I get out of this loop? Say this again. Quit. Uh, okay, so this loop is this guy right here. The quit command got me out of the loop that can got me out of this do while loop that controlled the menu. I'm still stuck in here. I'm still spinning in here. Go ahead. Break. Okay, so we have a command called break that breaks us out of the most local loop. Now let's assume you didn't know about break. Forgot it, never learned it, whatever. How else could I have gotten out of this loop? MacGyver approach. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Changing I such that the next time it spins up, this fails. Right? Because for loops are pre-check loops. So we are going to check that Boolean expression before we try to do anything else. So we could have arbitrarily just said I equal to jersey numbers dot length that would do it or we could say plus a thousand if, <laughs> if you want to really you know make your point you know but that'll work so now i is arbitrarily equal to jersey numbers dot length we just we uh, interjected and said i'm going to do a little bit more than just a plus plus i'm going to do a plus a lot and then we'll also do a plus plus so we'll set it to jersey number dot length It'll spin back up. Now it's jersey dot number dot length plus one. And is that, is I less than jersey number dot length? Nope. It's actually one greater than it right now. So we'll fail, we'll fall out. That makes sense? That's what break does. Break keeps us from having to do the, the, the math stuff. Instead, we can just say, you know what? I'm done with this loop. So I want to break out of it. So break immediately takes us out of the most local loop. Not an if statement, just loops. Okay? So this guy will get us out of uh, um, this for loop. So we'll be sitting right here when we break out of there. All right? So that means the very next line is the end of our if for the u. And then we're done with that. All right? Now, we really can't check whether this worked until we have written the replace player code. I'm sorry, not the replace player, the output roster code. 
you kind of want to see, did my change take effect? All right. So let's go ahead and write that really quickly because that's nice and short and sweet. doesn't require any real logic. It's just a for loop that prints everything. We already wrote it a few minutes ago. Um, so let's throw in here an else if option is equal to NO. So if we want to output our roster, okay, what do we do? Well, we're going to loop through our loop, or loop through one of our arrays, and then display jersey number and then player rating. All right, we can decide how we want to uh, um, display those. Um, maybe to keep it kind of shorter on the screen, we'll just display um, jersey number is the jersey number, and then in parentheses, maybe say rating colon and then whatever the rating is. Something like that. All right, so we'll have a little for loop for it i is equal to zero. I is less than jersey numbers dot length i plus plus, and we'll say system dot out dot print len, and we'll say jersey number colon plus jersey numbers at bucket i concatenated with a space open parenthesis concatenate that string with player ratings at bucket i concatenated with the word well space and the word rating close parenthesis something like that so we'll print to the screen the word jersey number followed by a space then we'll concatenate onto that the actual jersey number we're looking at we'll concatenate onto that a space followed by an opening parenthesis concatenate onto that the current player rating associated with that jersey number concatenate onto that a space followed by the word rating followed by a closing parenthesis so I'm just building a string here. You can make your string say whatever you want, but this kind of gives us a, you know, an output string that does something. Okay, so you didn't need to be this complex. And I think I have an extra little, there we go. Okay, so this will be if we choose O for our output. So let's go ahead and test this. So we'll go ahead and put our stuff in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so there's our menu. So let's go ahead and hit O to see our current roster so we have a nice, clean way of viewing this. All right, so here's our roster. So jersey number one has a rating of two. Jersey number three has a rating of four, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, we want to go ahead and update a player rating. So why don't we update jersey number three? Okay, so we'll hit you. Which player would you like to update? We'll do jersey number three. What's the new rating? Uh, let's do 45. This is kind of our ringer. <laughs> All right, so we'll press enter there. Seemingly did its job. So now we'll hit O to output the new thing. And there's our jersey number three has a rating of 45 now. That make sense? Okay. Now I've decided I'm done, so I'll hit quit get lost. Okay, so let's write these other parts. Uh, so replace a player is going to do pretty much the same logic for finding a player that we're replacing. So we're going to do that same search for jersey number stuff and then ask for new jersey number, new rating. So let's do that. So I'm going to I'm going to do these in order, so I'm going to kind of throw this in the middle here. So if option is equal to an R. That means I'm replacing some stuff. All right, so I'm going to steal this code for a moment because I'm, I'm going to modify that a little bit. Um, again, for you, type as much of it as you can. So we're going to say, what player would you like to replace? So we'll read in the jersey number. We'll spin through, find the jersey number. If this is the jersey number we're looking for, and I, I, I want to caveat this whole thing and say, 
we are not technically handling the case when they enter a jersey number that doesn't exist. And we just skip through it. All right, I don't think it will error out. We'll just not do anything, which is fine. But we don't give them any sort of feedback saying, hey, you screwed up. You didn't give me a jersey number. Or you didn't give me a correct jersey number. So what player would you like to replace? We'll read in the jersey number. Then we'll search through all our jersey numbers for that player. Okay. So we found the player that we want to replace. So we want to read in what's the... So basically we want to do this stuff right here. Enter the player, new player's jersey number. Enter the new player's rating. And we're doing that at bucket I. So enter new just did that this way. Enter new player's jersey number. We'll read it in to jersey numbers at bucket I because that's the guy we're replacing. Enter new player's rating. We'll read it in, overwrite the rating, and then we'll break out. So this should give us a brand new player in there. Let's go ahead and test this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let's uh, let's hit our output first to see our players. So let's go ahead and replace five with a new dude. So we'll hit R. Jersey number five is who we're replacing. Enter the new player's jersey number. Let's say 21. And rating is 11. So there's that. We'll hit output. So now we have a jersey number replacing the guy that used to be five with jersey number 21 and a rating of 11. Make sense? All right. So we have update working. We have output uh uh, no, I'm sorry. Then we have a replace player working. We have output working. So now the last one is output players above a rating. So this guy's pretty similar to output roster, except we're only going to output the roster if the rating is larger than a certain value. Okay. So that is what's the name of the option? That is A. Option A. So else if option is equal to A, we're going to go ahead and uh, read in what is the minimum rating, int min rating is equal to input dot Next int, then we're going to steal most of our code here for outputting a roster. But before we just randomly output a roster, we want to ask the question, if player ratings at bucket I is greater than or equal to min rating, then print them out. Make sense? So this will only do those guys. Let's just test it real quick. I know we're out of time. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, do A, and let's do only guys above uh, five for a rating. So this shows us a sub list of only the guys that have a high enough rating. Make sense? And then was there anything else in the assignment, or was that everything? everything okay uh, questions about that so for next class in the book we're going to start user defined methods read 6.1 through 6.8 and do all the little quizzes and stuff along the lines no no like dropbox homework but this is a reading assignment with the utility stuff might be a quiz related to it all right
I will see everybody on Tuesday. And I will take this code and I'll put it up as a snippet on uh, uh, Slack. Yep. Thank you.